Nice. Look at me. I'm Mass. looking. And start off by telling me your name, where you live, and what you do. My name is Gary Mack, G-A-R-Y-M-A-C-K. I'm the curator at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. I live in Arlington, Texas, as of a couple weeks ago. Are you uh, native to Texas? No, I was uh, born in, uh, in a Chicago suburb and moved around with uh, parents and uh, wound up in Texas in summer of 1976. So what keeps you in Texas? What do you like about it? Well, I moved here for the work opportunity. And uh, as part of my work in the, in the radio business, I got to meet a lot of the uh, Kennedy assassination researchers and I developed an interest in the subject the year before, um, and uh, it, it was just a fascinating place to live, and my professional career has always been here, and I've enjoyed it ever since. So what, you were doing, were doing radio work when you got interested in it? Yeah, I had been working in uh, Wichita, Kansas at a top 40 AM rock station there, uh, KLEO, and I was there in 1973, and this was in the era of the Watergate uh, revelations and uh, revelations in the congressional investigations about Cuba and uh, all these nefarious deeds that the US government was involved in. And it was also the period of time when the Zapruder film of the assassination was shown on national television the first time. And uh, as I recall, the ABC affiliate in Wichita didn't normally carry that program. It was Geraldo Rivera's late night talk show called Good Night America, but they didn't carry that program in Wichita, as, as I remember. Uh, I think they had a late night movie or something. But there had been some publicity about it and I was curious and I wanted to see the film. And uh, I knew the program director of the uh, radio station that was affiliated with the television station. And uh, I called him and asked if he could set it up so I could uh, watch the show when it was fed down by, uh, by the network. And he said, sure. And he did. So at 10.30 on whatever night it was, uh, I was at uh, Cake Television watching the uh, watching the uh, broadcast of the Zapruder film. And it was, it was just shocking, as, a, you know, as it was to, to everyone. And I just couldn't figure out how someone could be knocked you know, backward and to the left by a shot fired from behind. It seemed to me, not being an expert, of course, that uh, it seemed like the shot would have come from the front. So that, that started my interest in the assassination. And uh, moving to Dallas and getting to know the people who'd studied it all these years made it much easier to to uh, get involved with all this. So, uh, tell me about the kind of the progression of the museum's development. I mean, you were kind of were in there long before you actually had a position here, right? Yeah, I I don't remember the exact day or year, but it was somewhere in the early uh, or mid '80s. And I got a phone call from Conover Hunt, and uh, she was the project director, and she and uh, and others were involved in, in trying to get a museum going. She and uh, Lyndall and Adams uh, were knocking on doors and uh, asking for help and you know, we, we want to build a, a tasteful museum to handle this controversial subject and they'd gotten my name and number from uh, someone in town who said, well that Gary Mack knows a lot about the films and photographs, maybe he could help you get some pictures. Uh, and at this time I was working as an, an announcer and a producer at uh, KXAS TV, the NBC affiliate here in Dallas-Fort Worth. So you know, she, was, uh, she was an interesting woman and still is, and we're still very good friends and have been, golly, 20 years or so. Um, and I remember there were times when uh, she, was, she and Lyndall were just absolutely beat down to the ground by people, you know, closing doors in their face and saying, well, this is a terrible Kennedy assassination subject. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves, that kind of stuff. Uh, but my, my role was, was in the early days was just to give uh, some information and advice anytime they needed it. Um, and then as the museum uh, became a reality, and of course in those days it was just an exhibit, it wasn't thought of as a museum. In fact, it was spe uh, specifically designed not to be a museum. It's just going to be an exhibit, just to tell the story. But they realized they needed some video uh, up in the exhibit. And I was one of the people that they contacted to uh, put together some films and tapes and advise them on, on, on what images were out there. And uh, uh, John Sparks over at Channel 8 was one of the other people. Uh, Channel 4, the CBS affiliate at that time, um, had some kind of policy. And they were not, 
they did not participate. They did not let, let us use any of their footage. So consequently, the, the films that play in the exhibit to this day in 2003, although they include some CBS and Channel 4 originated video, all that was licensed from CBS, not from the Dallas CBS affiliate, which is uh, you know, an interesting story because uh, in 1995, I guess it was, uh, the uh, former CBS affiliate, uh, by then it had become the Fox affiliate here in town, and they donated all their footage to the Sixth Floor Museum. It was the first major media donation, and uh, it was uh, apparently because they were under new ownership, the Fox network bought them, and uh, so it, I, I was just thrilled to get that uh, donation, and it helped get some of the others that we got later on. So anyway, but to back to the, your original question, my role was uh, was uh, not very significant other than just uh, I was always available for information and questions and as it turned out uh, ultimately in 1993 when uh, Dealey Plaza was named a National Historic Landmark uh, they asked me to uh, to uh, join them you know they had a special section set out in Dealey Plaza to, for the, all the activities and that and I just couldn't go I was just unbelievably sick you know just sitting at home sniffling and coughing and wheezing and I missed that great moment but I saw it on television and taped it, so there you go. <laughs> so what kind of problems did they encounter trying to make this museum, make this exhibit first? Well, I, I don't remember any specifics other than they got far more refusals than they do, yeah, we'll help. And um, you know, I never accompanied them on any of these you know, journeys, and uh, but that was, certainly wasn't my role. Um, but I would hear the stories periodically. I mean, I'd, I'd come over here and meet with Conover in her office, or we'd uh, go to Alan and Cynthia Mondale's house, which was also their office, and they're the filmmakers who put the, put the films together. And she would toss out some of these war stories, and you know, I, I wish I'd taken notes. I just, I just didn't. Yeah, so, but she was, I guess the, the one story that, that she was uh, pretty upset about was they were starting to make some headway in 1984. And um, some doors were opening to them. Uh, the Belo Corporation uh, made phone calls uh, on their behalf, or well, I don't even know if it was on their behalf, but the Belo Corporation made some some calls to people who said, who, they basically said, you know, this is something we need to do, and this is what you know you're going to play a part in it, right? That <laughs> that kind of phone call. But I remember when uh, in 1984, when the Republican National Convention was held in Dallas. Ronald Reagan was running for his second term, and you know there wasn't any opposition, so it was really kind of a, a formality. And the news media came to town, and they're basically walking around with, you know, the story is already written. You know, there's not much new to to do. And you know, like the second night, I think I think it was a three-day affair. The second night, the book depository catches fire. So so they're all down here at like midnight, and you know the. The, the fire engines are around, the hook and ladders are there, and the ladders are up, and you know the, the guys are carrying hoses just ready to, to flood water into the building. And uh, it, it didn't happen. They had to, the fire wasn't that bad. It was confined to the basement and I guess the first floor. But what it meant was it embarrassed the city. That building embarrassed the city once again by disrupting the Republican National Convention. How dare this terrible thing come back to haunt us? And I remember Conover telling me that uh, uh, appointments that were that, that they had set up were canceled, <laughs> you know things like that. It was just, and it, it really uh, brought things to a to a halt for well, yeah, a good year, because it was just the fear has always been in Dallas. Not that there was some big conspiracy, but that this event would embarrass the city again. You know, uh, the 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 stories about Dallas and how it was portrayed unfairly and inaccurately by the. East Coast and West Coast news media are uh, a matter of record, and uh, people from the news business swooped into town to try and cover this story. And they don't know about Texas. This is a foreign planet, you know, a distant land to them. And uh, manners and customs are different here than they are in, in the Big Apple or whatever. And uh, Dallas was branded as a city of nuts and wackos, and it, it's just not true. And uh, it was a conservative city, and it still is. And uh, there's no secret that uh, John Kennedy was disliked in this city, but the election was fairly close. I mean, it, it wasn't a landslide in 1960. Uh, the city did go for Nixon, but not by a huge margin. 
And when you look at the films and photographs of the Kennedy motorcade and you know, try and get a, a crowd estimate, you're looking at somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people. Well, 200,000 is more than half the entire city population. So someone liked him. So they came out to see him. And uh, that part of the story doesn't get told very well. Um, it, it just comes down to um, uh, this guy, Lee Harvey Oswald, who you know, was a left-wing sympathizer. Um, the initial news reports were that some right-wing uh, ultra-conservative from Dallas had, was behind the assassination. Well, then they drag out this scraggly left-wing Oswald, and that doesn't make any sense, and that just confounds the news people even more. So the city has always been very, very sensitive to the way it's portrayed in, in this story, and uh, a, a lot of people uh, just wish it would go away, and of course it never does. We kind of think of it around here at the museum as uh, one of the longest-running current affairs, uh, one of the longest-running current events in history. It is a current event. I follow the, the, the newspapers and the, and the TV news, and there's hardly a week goes by when there isn't something about this subject in the news. You know, even if it's just an obituary, some, well, you know, some cop who was involved in something that day, passing away, or some new theory coming out, or some new book coming out. There's always something. It's really kind of interesting. It's amazing, really, that all these years later, and it's just it's like it happened yesterday for a lot of people. Tell me what it is that you do on a daily basis, or what is your job at Dale? Well, my job's sort of changed since I came on board in 1994. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the museum actually started out as just an exhibit. But uh, almost from the first day, people would drop things off, even if it was just a newspaper, uh, a Dallas newspaper from that weekend. And gradually, they realized that people had things. They had stuff, and they didn't know what to do with it didn't want to throw it away. Some of them thought that, uh, well, maybe their pictures might be valuable, or I have a book, and I bet you it's the only one. And uh, so those things were collected, and uh, eventually it was pretty obvious that this museum, because of uh, the huge visitation, which was like 300 to 400,000 uh, after just only a few years, uh, needed to work very hard at doing all the other things that an educational institution should do. And this is at a time when the board of directors was uh, trying to decide you know, wh what to do with this uh, institution, is, you know, to grow it or to leave it the same size. And um, they hired Jeff West, and, and Jeff does not have a museum background. And he had the vision, he understood what this subject is and, and where it belongs in history. So Jeff was brought on board, and that's the first thing he did was start growing the institution. And I was one of the first of the new hires to take care of the collection and to actively go out and say, will you give us your things? We want to preserve them. We want to make them available. Since then, um, because there's so much misinformation and bad information out there, we've tried to take on the role of helping people understand what the real information is. What's the nonsense? Or what's the outdated stuff? What's the new thinking? So I've had to try and keep up with all these theories and new developments as best I could, and there have been a lot, surprisingly, in the last 10 or 12 years. The Oliver Stone film started people thinking uh, in a way that they probably hadn't done for 20 years or so. Um, I think most people realize that the, the Stone film was a collection of theories, and probably most of them aren't true. But you know, if, if some of them are true, why? It can't be just Oswald. So people started treating the subject seriously again. And as a result of that, uh, Congress passed this legislation uh, called the, the, the JFK Act of 1992, which basically said the United States government has to release every damn piece of paper it has on the Kennedy assassination. A remarkable development. I'm still amazed by that. And as a result, millions of pages have come out. A whole slew of new books and theories have come out. There's new information out there. There's nothing that changes the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald probably did it. But there's enough information and uh, there are enough holes in the story that reasonable people can look at this information and wonder, well, what the heck really happened? So as best we can figure out now, the, the role of the museum is to try and help people sort through that stuff without putting our own spin on things. I mean, we, you know, we, we all have our own 
pet theories and beliefs as to what happened, and we're supposed to leave those at home. And uh, in my role as the curator, I, I'm supposed to know both sides or, you know, all 15 sides. I, I don't know if I can do that, but someone's got to at least make an attempt to uh, have the, the straightforward facts out there. What was uh, your involvement with the Dallas community when you first came here? And what kind of people were we remembering or looking at the thing then? Well, actually, when I first came to Texas in 1976, I lived in Fort Worth. The radio station I worked for, the offices and studios were in Fort Worth, actually in the west side. So I lived in far southwest Fort Worth, and I rarely came over to Dallas. Um, I'd come over here for business meetings. Uh, I was program director of the radio station, and the record companies were over here, and the uh, talent agents and bookers and concert promoters were all in Dallas, so I'd come over here periodically. And uh, you know, I'd usually drive through Dealey Plaza, you know, take a few minutes when I could. But I just, I worked very hard at, um, at my radio career um, for I don't know, three or four years. And then I got the feeling, you know, I might want to do something different. And radio was in a state of big change at that point. Our station was a FM top 40 station, Z97. And we were in the top five for most of those two or three years. And then disco came out and split the audience in half. And we had to decide, well, we're either going to play rock and roll and disco, or we're going to get clobbered. And there was just, there was no safe way to do that. You, you know, you, you can't have a radio station that, that, that appealed to both. And uh, I, told the, <laughs> I told the general manager that, and that's not what he wanted to hear. So I got canned, and they hired someone who said, oh, yeah, we can do that, sure. Well, of course, it didn't work, and he got fired six, eight months later, too, and the station was sold. Um, but that got me into television. Um, I'd always been interested in television, uh, didn't know anything about it uh, from the inside, but they needed an announcer, and I was willing to work at the price that they were offering, which was okay, but it wasn't great. But I saw a great opportunity, and I spent only 14 years at the NBC station. I just loved it. It was great. And, uh, but what it did for me was it opened a lot of doors at the other stations. So I was lucky enough to not only meet some people who uh, covered the Kennedy assassination, but I got in to see the, what the stations had. I got to see the, the footage that you know they, they dip into only occasionally when they tell the story. And uh, so people got to know me and, and my reputation. So that, that's helped tremendously here at the museum. because uh, We work very closely with the news media. They always have questions. Um, most of the people working in the media today, of course, weren't alive uh, at the time Kennedy was shot, and they have no clue what this story is all about. You know, they've, they've seen the Oliver Stone film, and they know enough to say, well, that can't be true, is it? You know, they don't know, so, so we get to help those people. Anyway, so in a, long, in a, in a roundabout way, I've wound up uh, being in a, in a position that's just most rewarding uh, f for me. I mean, it's the kind of job I do for free if I could afford to live. I mean, it, it, it bothers me that there's so much bad information out there. I, I just wish someone knew the full story. I really do. And so you don't tell anybody really knows the full story? Well, someone might know. Um, you know, one of the arguments against conspiracy in the Kennedy story is that, uh, well, you know, people can't keep a secret, um, especially for this, this this long a period of time, 40 years, and how, how do you keep a secret? Well, <laughs> when, when people tell me that, I usually you know, lean into them and say, and Deep Throat's name was? And they don't know, because that's a secret. There are only three or four people who know who Deep Throat was in the Watergate caper. So secrets can be held. Um, it's, it's very difficult, though, to put Lee Harvey Oswald into a, con into a conspiracy, because he, he wasn't hanging out with other people. Um, most of the last hours and, and last week of his life were very well documented. He wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't making phone calls. Uh, he, 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 he didn't have visitors at his rooming house. Uh, there are a few hours that are unaccounted for, but that's just on one day. So you know, if there was a, a plot of some sort, it, it would look like it, it didn't involve Oswald at all because he just wasn't hanging out with anybody. But it was his gun that was found, and apparently his gun was used 
to shoot. So who could have had access to it? Who fired it? So it's very difficult to, to come up with a plausible conspiracy theory when you got a guy like Oswald who was a loner. He really was a loner. So I don't know. You know I'm staying tuned for the next chapter, and I'm sure there'll be another one real soon. And as far as uh, keeping the secret, you throw a sample in, it still makes me think like there's a lot more people that have, need to be involved in a conspiracy of this magnitude than the number of people who know you throw a sample. Well, maybe, um, but it, it could have been just a very, very good, uh, well-constructed plot. I mean, you would have to know where Oswald's rifle was. You'd, you'd have to get it without him knowing about it. So let's say you, uh, you knew that it was out in the, at the house in uh, Irving. You'd have to go get it without anyone in the house knowing. And you'd have to hope that on a whim, Oswald the night before wouldn't think, hey, let me go, I'm going to go look at my rifle. You know, he would have found it was gone. Um, and there are all sorts of little problems like that that you run into. Um, you'd have to make sure that Oswald didn't call in sick that day. What, what if Oswald didn't come to work today? You can't fire his gun, so you have to go get some other gun. Well, then what do you do? Um, you have to make sure that Oswald uh, and his whereabouts are unknown at the time of the shooting. I mean, he, when, the, when, the, when his co-workers said, hey, Lee, let's go watch the president, what if he had said, okay, well, then what do you do? So that's where these conspiracy theories fall apart. They aren't practical. You know, they fail the common sense test. And yet, the evidence is that uh, a significant number of people in Dealey Plaza thought shots came from uh, either two locations or from a location other than the Book Depository Building. And the fact that they didn't find anyone doesn't necessarily mean that no one was there. It just means they didn't find anyone. He got away. Well, how could someone get away? Well, I don't know. Um, I do know that the Dallas police uh, did not open up every single car that was parked in the parking lot. Um, there are photographs in the museum's collection showing two officers writing down information as the cars left the parking lot that afternoon. Well, where's the list? Well, no one knows. The list has vanished. So th does that mean something sinister? Well, not necessarily. It just means that the list is gone. I mean, someone might have thought, well, this is ridiculous. These people are all book depository employees. You know who they are. Uh, and their whereabouts are accounted for, so we don't need this list. But that doesn't make any sense either. So I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, what was your involvement with the House? The House Select Committee? Yeah. I didn't have any direct connection uh, with them. I, I certainly didn't work with them on anything. Um, as the one who theorized that the assassination might have been recorded, uh, I listened to the Dallas police uh, recordings of the radio broadcasts, and uh, that was my theory, that there might be as many as seven shots. I found a, a place on the, on the tape that had noises that sounded like they could be distorted gunshots, and there were seven of them, and I thought, well, golly, there could have been as many as seven shots if these are shots. And I wrote an article about that for one of the conspiracy newsletters, and one of the local researchers who was invited to Washington to brief the House Select Committee on conspiracy theories mentioned at the end of this two-day discussion, by the way, there's this guy in Fort Worth who thinks that the Dallas police uh, radio re uh, tapes might have the assassination on it. Well, this was uh, an amazing development for them, and they decided to check it out. And ultimately, they wound up with recordings. And the recordings were analyzed and subjected to a test. They fired test shots in Dealey Plaza and recorded those to see if the sound patterns would match, and they did. And uh, as, a, as a result of all that, the committee found that there were four shots fired that day, not three, and that of the four, the third came from the grassy knoll. So based on that, they decided that there was a conspiracy to kill Kennedy, yet Oswald was the one who killed Kennedy. Well, that's the other official version of history. The Warren Report says Oswald alone. So the, uh, the case is in limbo. Because this was such a startling revelation, um, a follow-up study was done in 1982, which concluded that the noises on the tape that were thought to be shots are not shots at all. They didn't know what they were, but they knew they weren't shots for a technical reason. 
So I don't know. Um, I know the original scientists stand by their original work. Um, I did not know them at that time. Uh, what happened early on after this, uh, after Mary Farrell, the Dallas researcher, mentioned my theory to them, the House Committee called me and they said, can we have your tape? And I said, well, yeah, I guess, but what you really ought to do is go after the original recordings. And I said, you know, I'd really, why bother with this tape when, you know, you ought to get the original recordings? Well, they were pretty insistent that they wanted my tape. So I sent them my tape, uh, or a copy of it, I guess. Uh, but eventually they found what they thought were the original recordings. And of course, now the, the, the belief is that these are not the original recordings at all, that they're actually a copy. So, you know, this is, a, this is another uh, continuing story. I don't know where it's going to go. And uh, you also appeared in the documentary, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, mm -hmm. correct? Was, were you contacted about that? Or? Well, that, The Man Who Killed Kennedy grew out of uh, the realization by um, British television that not only were British subjects, British citizens uh, interested in the Kennedy assassination, but it was coming up on the 25th anniversary of the assassination, and they wanted to do a documentary. They wanted to do a documentary about the conspiracy theories. They hired a producer director named Nigel Turner, and they, they gave him a terrific budget, um, and about two years. And uh, Nigel contacted Robert Groden. Uh, because of uh, his work with the Zapruder film and told Robert that uh, was there anyone in Dallas who he knew that he could recommend to, to assist them with, with their work. And he said, well, yeah, call, call Gary Mack. He, he knows all the films and photographs down there and he has the contacts. You ought to give him a call. And uh, Nigel did and uh, he was aware of the, the Badge Man photograph, which is the blow up in the Mary Mormon picture, and he wanted to use that and uh, I told him no, because uh, I just wasn't letting people use it just because it looks like it might be a gunman in the background. Um, but I said, you know, if you can have some scientific study done of this picture, then you can use it for free. Well, he liked that. Um, so we eventually met, and I wound up working for him as a consultant. Um, I was paid for my work on consulting, um, you know, what films exist. I mean, I, I basically told him, tell me what event you want to you want to illustrate with stills or, or moving images, and I can tell you if, if there is such a thing. So I worked on them, I worked with them that way, and uh, it was a most enjoyable process. But I remember when he first came, up, came to town, I told him that I didn't want any secrets. I didn't want to be, you know, uh, sandbagged, as it were, by something goofy in the, in the show. And he said, well, there's one thing we're working on that we're not telling anybody about. And I said, well, then I don't want to be involved. I don't want... I don't want to be shocked by something. And he said, no, 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 we've got legitimate people working on this, and we've checked it out, and on and on and on, and I said, well, okay. And that was this Corsican hit team stuff. And uh, part of my arrangement with uh, Nigel, part of the payment for my services, and uh, Nigel was over here for months. I'm on the phone with him constantly, we're, we're at meetings, and you know, we worked hard on that show. And it shows, I mean, technically, it's terrific. And much of the material in there is very, very good. Most of the black and white footage in The Men Who Killed Kennedy has never been seen outside of Dallas. It all came from the NBC affiliate where I worked because I told you know, my bosses, I said, I think this is a legitimate deal. Can we have access to the station's footage? And they said, okay. Um, part of my arrangement with Nigel was that I would be flown to England to see the show or a, a rough cut of the show before it aired. And not only did he fly me, but he flew my, my wife and son. So we had a few days in England at the uh, courtesy of uh, Central Independent Television, which was the network that had commissioned Nigel. And I remember um, watching a rough cut of the Badge Man segment uh, and with Gordon Arnold and this very moving interview. And uh, I, I knew what had, what had transpired with the interview uh, before seeing it because Nigel had called me after this interview with Gordon Arnold that he had done a few months earlier. But to see the show or to see that part of it was just uh, just an incredibly rewarding experience because it finally looked like you know we're we're making progress with this subject. But he didn't tell me about this Corsican hit team stuff. And the show premiered in England in October of 1988. And just before, just after that, I received in the mail a tape of the show, 
and I watched it and I just was appalled. Because this Corsican hit team stuff was basically one guy saying, well, I overheard a conversation and I know one of the guys in the conversation, he's, he's a legitimate guy and therefore this must be true. That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> and uh, I still have that tape and I'm glad I do because uh, <laughs> the uh, original broadcast of the show named the three guys by name as being the ones who killed Kennedy. Two of them were still alive. One was a, supposed to be a drug runner or something and they didn't think he'd ever surface and complain. The other guy that they couldn't find or he wouldn't talk to them or something. Well, as it turns out, these two guys who were still alive had absolute alibis. Not only were they not in Dallas, they weren't even in the United States when Kennedy was shot. And one of the two guys, the, uh, the legitimate one, <laughs> hired an attorney um, and threatened to sue so they quickly put together a, uh, an apology kind of show. It ran about half an hour. They taped it in Washington, D.C. Groden was there. Robert Blakey from the House Committee was there, even though the House Committee had long since gone away. And several others, and they, they kicked this thing around. But they showed the film interview with this French guy who said, uh, well, I was, in the, I was in, the, in the Navy, the French Navy or something, and you know, he held up, you know, here's my documentation that proves it. And, you know, the paperwork is there. You know, so this Corsican hit team thing just evaporated, uh, as well it should have. It just was not researched properly. What it did was prevent the Men Who Killed Kennedy series from being seen in this country for three or four years. Because what happened was the program was a sensation in England initially, and all three major networks and PBS over here wanted the rights to the show. But they told Nigel and Central Independent Television that they had to re-edit the Corsican hit team part. I mean, you can't name people as being assassins if they aren't assassins. <laughs> you get sued. Well, the problem for Central was if they agreed to that, then that's the same thing as admitting we were wrong. And at that point, they weren't admitting that. They were still trying to check out the story. So eventually, as the full story came out that this Corsican hit team stuff was nonsense, everyone else, you know, the networks lost interest. And uh, so finally it was re-edited. They, they settled with the uh, Central, settled, settled with the, uh, the Corsican guy, and they re-edited that segment and wound up placing it on, uh, I think it aired on the History Channel or A&E um, in 90, 91. And it's been a, a staple of the History Channel ever since. It's, uh, I've, I've heard from insiders that for many, many years, it was far and away the most popular program A&E had ever run. And I heard from Nigel, oh, a year after the premiere of the show, that uh, Central had, had placed that show in syndication in virtually every English-speaking country on the planet. Several hundred million people have seen that show. And, you know, it, Nigel meant well. I mean, I, I don't have any ill feelings toward the man, but, you know, the Corsican hit team just, just killed that show. And there's a lot of good stuff in there. Some of it's been, been disproven since then, but, you know, that was, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, and a lot has come out since then. I wish I, wish I knew then what I know now about this subject. Um, very very complicated subject now. Uh, is it the men who killed Kennedy, they also talk about the whole sewer idea? Well, it's, it's the sewer theory is in part six of the men who killed Kennedy. I was involved in parts one and two only. Parts three, four, and five, uh, I remember Nigel calling me, um, asking a couple questions, but it, my work was essentially in, in parts one and two. Part six was done many years later, like in 95, 96, or something like that. And it's just nonsense, just nonsense. Um, the sewer theory is r ridiculous because um, when you stand in the, in the sewer and you place a vehicle, or if you stand where Kennedy was when, when the fatal shot hit him, you can't see him from the sewer. He hadn't come down the street far enough. The most you could have seen was the front bumper of the car. And if anyone had bothered to do the, you know, to study it fairly and accurately, they'd realize that. There was no shot from the sewer. You can take one of these schematic diagrams at Dealey Plaza and draw a line from the sewer to Kennedy. Well, yeah, but you can't get your head out the opening 
to you know to line up to aim, you know, you'd have to do this, fire blindly. I mean, it's just it's just nutty. That's why a lot of people just dismiss the whole Kennedy conspiracy idea completely because there have been so many nutty theories and goofy looking people promoting them that people just throw up their hands and say, well, it's all, this is all nonsense. That's not true. It's not true. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I was going to ask you what, what the nuttiest theory you've ever heard. You know? <laughs> How much, we don't have time to, for, the, for the nuttiest theory. Well, I, I, I don't know. You could pick any of them. Jackie did it. That's one of the nuttiest. She knew about his womanizing and uh, had, she went to Aristotle Onassis and he hired one of his, you know, one of his buddies or something like that to kill him. Uh, I don't know. They're just, there are more nutty ones than, than good ones, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yeah, switch gears a little bit. All right. Go back to uh, what did you think of President Kennedy mm. as a president, person? Well, I was a senior in high school when he was killed, and I wasn't politically active. Um, I remember um, watching him on television and uh, kind of chuckling at his, at his funny accent, and you know, he'd pronounce Cuba as Cuber and things like that. But uh, he was an interesting fellow, as I recall, and it was fun to read about him and see him on television now and then. My parents were uh, staunch Republicans. They would never have voted for Kennedy. And uh, you know, this is even though I was 17 at the time and turned 18 in the summer of 64, um, I wouldn't have been able to vote in the 64 election. I think you had to be 21 in those days. So, but I remember my dad and mom talking about him and uh, he wasn't getting things done. And the record's pretty clear. I mean, he, he didn't get much legislation passed through. But the ideas and the, the things that he's remembered for um, were, were carried out by uh, to a great extent by Lyndon Johnson. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, that was legislation that Johnson pushed through, but it started in the Kennedy administration. Kennedy gets credit for the space race. Well, of course, it didn't start under him. It started in the Eisenhower administration. But he's the one who said that uh, you know, we're going to set foot on the moon by the end of this decade. You know, he basically said, we're going to make it happen. And those kinds of inspiring words and people who say them are so important to the nation and the nation's history. And that's why so many people are, uh, think about him often and wish someone like him were still around. I have a good friend in town named uh, Greg Martin, Mitch Martin, to his friends. And uh, Mitch is a conservative and a Republican, huge fan of John F. Kennedy. Now, he probably wouldn't have voted for him, but just... Uh, admires the man greatly and uh, Mitch was also a, a big fan of Ronald Reagan. He just marveled at the similarities between the two. How basically Ray, uh, Reagan as a liberal Republican, which you know if that's a contradiction of terms or not, was basically doing the same thing that John F. Kennedy was doing. Um, and of course he would, <laughs> Reagan would often borrow Kennedy's phrases and, and things like that. Um, but he really, Reagan and, and Kennedy were very much alike and I guess I'm no expert at these things, but I mean, if you study Kennedy politics and Reagan politics, apparently uh, there, there are very strong similarities in, in, in your approach to things. Kennedy's classic line, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, was the kind of approach that Ronald Reagan took. Uh, can you tell me the story of where you were that day? You bet. You bet. Um, I was having lunch in the cafeteria at uh, George Washington High School in Denver. And uh, this is a Friday, and uh, my favorite soup was and still is potato soup, and we always had potato soup on Friday. And I was eating my potato soup. It was 11.35, 11.40, somewhere in there. And I was with uh, three or four of my friends, Jim Bonney and uh, one or two, probably two others. And our table was near the door to the cafeteria. And this was a big high school. This was only the second year it was open. Our graduating class was like 800. There were 2,200 in the high school. And I remember the assistant principal walked in and he stood right next to our table. Now, you know, when the, when the grown-ups come in and they, they want the room to quiet down, they just walk in and stand there until <laughs> till people notice them. And, you know, you hear say, hey, quiet, 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 that kind of thing. And as he was waiting for everybody to quiet down, I, I noticed his lower lip was trembling. 
He was, he was really nervous. And it just, it just seemed odd, because, you know, we'd seen him in the, in the high school assemblies, and, you know, he'd come to step in and, you know, sit in on the classes now and then. This was very different. And I don't remember his words, but uh, he said, uh, essentially, we, we, we've heard a reporting that uh, President Kennedy has been shot in Dallas. We don't know if it's serious or not. Um, we'll try to keep you informed of what's going on, but uh, at this point, at least, we're going to continue with our schedule. Uh, but uh, listen to the PA system, uh, see if we have any further announcements. Unbelievable. It was so, so shocking. We stayed and uh, finished lunch, as I recall, for another 10 or 15 minutes. I don't know why I get all wound up on this. And walking through the hallway on the way to class, there was a girl who fainted, or uh, we were later learned that she had fainted. She'd fallen through a glass window, very badly cut. We continued on to class, and my class was a history class, and uh, U.S. history. And by this point in time, um, they had been able to pick up a Dallas radio station through one of the local Denver radio stations, and they were piping it through the PA system so we could actually hear the news broadcasts as they were happening. Very, very exciting. As it turns out, I didn't, didn't realize it then, but uh, I know now it was KLIF Radio, which had a very dramatic way of presenting the news and uh, kind of over the top, you know, with these important pronouncements and the way they talked and all that. It was very exciting. And I remember that the history professor, um, maybe like 10 minutes or so into this, said, well, that's enough for now. Click. Off it went. It w <laughs> we were all just amazed, and she thought, look, all we're hearing is that he, he was wounded. Um, I'm sure it's not serious, you know, because it was, it was so unthinkable in those days. And she said, you know, we've got a lot to do. We've got to get going here. I'm sure we'll hear something if, you know. So <laughs> we finished the rest of the period not knowing what was going on. It was just appalling in a history class. So. Uh, and then we got word after the class, I guess, that uh, Kennedy had died, and we had the choice. We could go home if we wanted, or stay at the school, or if we needed to you know, make phone calls to the house, you know, or to someone to get a ride home, we could do that. So I remember walking home. I remember... Uh, watching all weekend, pretty much. And it was just, I remember in the early hours, it was very frustrating because you didn't, you know, we didn't have camera, live cameras running around at Dealey Plaza. We had film cameras and uh, it, it, I, as I learned later, it took a while before the film could be shown on television. And we just weren't seeing much. You know? I mean, there were people sitting behind desks and you know, they were talking about this terrible event and you weren't seeing anything but people sitting behind desks for the most part. And eventually, yeah, I remember, you know, our TV didn't have a remote control. Most TVs didn't in those days. And, you know, I, I was up and down, up and down, back and changing channels. You know, I remember the folks say, leave it on one channel, would you? That kind of thing. What a bizarre weekend. And I remember after watching so many hours straight through that I slept late on Sunday morning. And my mom came up, and my, my room was on the upper floor, uh, and she woke me up saying, they've just shot him, they've just shot him. And I'm thinking, what, who, huh? Oswald, they just shot Oswald. So I got downstairs in time to see the videotape replay of, of that, it was just amazing. You know, that's an interesting thing. It's so common to see replays today. It was unheard of then. That's the first time it had, a, a videotape replay had ever been used other than in a football game. And a football game, they'd only done it like two weeks earlier. That's how they got the idea. So, you know, when you look at the old videotapes, and it's amazing that so many of them survive, you know, it was all black and white coverage. You know, they didn't have uh, any, color, uh, any color to speak of. Uh, and it's so primitive. <laughs> And to see that videotape replay was just amazing. Amazing. So, there you go. I'm gonna change this tape here. Okay. Just about to run out.
part so, two. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me kind of what you think of kind of the subculture that's developed out here, the, the X and the vendors and the people setting up their stands. And... Oh yes, the subculture. Well, it, it, it's still quite astounding to me that all these years later, most people don't believe that Lee Harvey Oswald did it all by himself. The public opinion surveys taken since that weekend show that fewer than 50% believe it was just Oswald. So. At that level, the Warren Commission absolutely failed to convince most people of what had happened. And the public opinion surveys now generally are in the 70 to 90 percent range, which is pretty normal. I mean, when there's a big conspiracy theory out and you do a public opinion survey right away, the numbers are much higher. And then after, you know, the following year, if there's nothing new, you know, the figures are much lower. But there's just always been this unease about the assassination. And most people, if you ask them, well, what should we do about this? They say, well, nothing. The guy's dead. Leave him, let him rest in peace. But there's also um, a small group of people, and some of them are just really concerned. Most of them are just really concerned that this isn't right. They don't know what it, what it all means or how it fits in, but they're just concerned. But some of them are just, are just paranoid, and some are just typical government haters. Um, so the folks who study the assassination and talk about the assassination um, tend to not be the historians and reporters. They tend to be the folks on the fringes for various reasons, which uh, I guess isn't surprising. It's just it's disappointing because what's happened is uh, the nutty theories get a lot of play and publicity and uh, smart people to look at them and just think, well, this whole thing is nutty, so I'm just going to ignore it. And uh, what that means is if there was something more to it than just Oswald, the time is probably lost now to, to be able to do something significant about it. But hey, I could be fooled. I, uh, I could be completely wrong about that. It could be that there is something out there that just hasn't come out yet, and when it does, it, it will be significant. I, mean, I don't know anything. I don't. Um, I personally believe that the recording of the assassination, or what was thought to be a recording of the assassination, is a recording of the assassination, um, and that means two shooters. And I can't figure out how Oswald could be either one of them. But you know, I don't know. The scientists could be wrong. I mean, they're not perfect. They're they're not supposed to be wrong, but <laughs> sometimes they are. I don't know. I don't know. I just. It's really quite ironic that the people who are spending the most energy to convince people of, that there is a conspiracy are the ones who most people don't pay any attention to. There's a great irony there. And maybe it says something profound, I don't know. Uh, I've heard that some people kind of feel you've gone over to the dark side by working in well, yeah, I know there are lots of theories about me and rumors about me, and you know, I, I tell everybody, look, the museum is neutral. We don't tell people what happened because we don't know. We tell people what the Warren Commission said happened. We tell them what the House Committee said happened, and that's all we can do. It's a very complicated subject, and we try and make it real simple, and if someone wants to go out and do their own research and learn more, terrific. If they, if they want to go out and, you know, rather go to a ball game, terrific. You know, we've done our part. Um, I'm personally a conspiracy person, have been since 1975, and I haven't seen anything to change that. What I have seen, and working at the museum has, has helped me in that respect, what I have seen is that the conspiracy side of the story is usually not presented fairly. The conspiracy books, by and large, present only one side of the story. They don't tell you the all the necessary information. Um, for example, the, the big myth is that the, there was a last minute change in the motorcade route to bring the vehicle closer to the building and thus easier to, to shoot Kennedy. What they don't tell you is that's not true. Uh, and the theory started because a newspaper illustration was wrong. And these conspiracy theorists 
look at the incorrect map in the Dallas Morning News and decide there's something sinister going on, whereas most objective people would look at the map and say, well, the map is wrong, not the motorcade route. <laughs> uh, and sorting through that stuff is just, uh, you know, for, for most people, it's just very difficult. Um, but, you know, I've had to learn to, to do that. Um, when, uh, in 1990, when Ricky White came forward to say his father, a Dallas police officer at the time, was the grassy Noel gunman. He held a press conference and it was big to do about all this. And uh, I started looking into that story with a friend of mine named Dave Perry. And uh, we decided eventually that this story was an absolute fabrication. And we'd found earlier versions of the story in which the details were different. And this had been a working manuscript that had gone through two different writers <laughs> before the, the press conference. And that's when I realized that a lot of this conspiracy talk was just nonsense, but not all of it. And that's when I started realizing that there was another side to these issues. And I started reading the, um, the, the anti-conspiracy side, if you will. And that's helped me greatly here at the museum. I mean, uh, my job here is to be able to provide factual, objective information. Uh, if the director gets a call from the news media that he can't answer, um, he's going to pick up the phone and say, Gary, what's the answer to this? And I need to tell him. I need to be able to, to tell him either right on the spot or say, I, I don't know, but I do know someone who will know. Let me check and I'll get back to you. Uh, that's our obligation to, to, to the community, to give accurate, honest, objective information. Do you ever uh, go to visit some of the other sites, like the Oswald-related sites? Well, I've been to most of the places. Um, I mean, I haven't been to the uh, to the uh, cemetery where Tippett has been uh, was buried, but I've, I've been to Oswald's grave, and I've been to the rooming house and the the Neely Street address where the uh, backyard photos were taken. They were taken, by the way. Um, Uh, yeah, and I've, I've been to the sites in Oak Cliff, so so I've seen the places. I've seen the places, and uh, you know, it's it's like anyone who comes to Dealey Plaza the first time. It all, always looks so small when you're here. On television, it looks like this big open field or something. And uh, when you walk around in the old Dallas Police Station, uh, you know, it's 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 strange because the the hallway is the same. You know, the hallway that Oswald was marched up and down from. Captain Fritz's office back to his jail cell. It's all the same. It's all still there. <laughs> same color and everything that kind of putrid green looking stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it would be nice if someday that, that uh, people interested in this subject would be able to see all these places. Um, the rooming house is owned by the sister, uh, daughter rather, of the woman who owned it at the time. And she's kept it pretty much the way it was back then. Um, Oswald's room is still there, although it's filled with bookcases right now. But it's essentially the same on the outside as it was then. And, you know, it'd be nice to be able to walk around in there and feel what it must have been like back in 1963, but you can't do that. And so that's unfortunate, but maybe someday that'll change. Uh, can you tell me what you think of the Kennedy Memorial? Uh, the Kennedy Memorial. Well, the controversy about it is uh, pretty well known. People don't understand what it means. You know, it's an open tomb. Uh, the, the spirit of John F. Kennedy is not going to be confined anywhere. Um, his, uh, uh, his memory is, is what you make of him. The practical side was that it was designed to wall off the outside noises from the streets and also people could concentrate on their own personal thoughts of John F. Kennedy. Um, it's my understanding that the uh, architect, of course, uh, had a discussion with the Kennedy family, and even though there wasn't any detail discussed, um, the memorial was meant to be a place, a tribute of some sort. Um, whether it achieved the goal that the architect and the city wanted, eh, that might be debatable. I mean, it's unfortunate that people come there and you know they scratch their head and say, "Well, I don't understand. What's what's this?" And, they don't understand it. So, but we've got the explanations out there. The, uh, the, uh, the signs are there that tell the story, and, and that helps. Um, I think it's a shame, though, obviously, that it took so many years, well, seven years, I guess, for the city to um, 
finally and firmly uh, recognize President Kennedy. It, it took several years to get all the details worked out, but you know, I'm glad they did it. You know, it, it ought to stay. I, mean, I was just appalled last year when there was talk about moving the, the memorial. I mean, that's just outrageous. What an insult that would have been. How do people come up with these ideas? I, I don't know. What personal feeling does it give you? Do you feel the, do you connect with what the, art, what the architect is trying to do? No, I, I really don't. I don't uh, go over there to think about President Kennedy. I think about him all the time, every day, when I'm here uh, uh, at the office and, of course, times at home. Um, I would like to be able to just walk out the door and leave President Kennedy and that whole story right here in the building, but uh, it doesn't work that way. Actually, I enjoy walking around the plaza now and then. Um, I, I can't make sense of what happened. It, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, it could have happened the way the Warren Commission said, but I, I just don't see it. Um, it's so important that Dealey Plaza remain as is. Uh, the way it looks today in 2003 is fairly close to 1963. Um, and I understand the museum's plans and the city's plans are to, are to return it even more to 1963. Um, it needs to stay that way. It really does because the shooting and the surrounding events are so confusing. Uh, you really ought to have a place to go where you can walk around and experience what it must have been like. I don't know that it's going to answer any questions, um, but you, you need to be able to see the place and be in the place to understand what happened in the place. Speaking of this place as a place, and uh, uh, thinking of George Vanderman Dealey. Mm -hmm. I've heard of him. Yeah. What do you uh, What do you think of him and his significance to Dallas? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've read the biographies of Dealey. Um, I know some people over at the Dallas Morning News and at Channel 8, the uh, stations owned by the Belo Corporation, and that's what that family is all about. I don't think of it that way. Um, Dealey Plaza is a specific place that uh, has nothing really to do with George Bannerman Dealey. And, uh, although I, I do wonder on occasion what the, the Dealey family and people close to the Dealey family must make of all this. I mean, because, you know, when there are news stories about the Kennedy assassination or the books or the movies, you know, they, they always mention Dealey Plaza. Their name is just, you know, wrapped up in this thing. And they had nothing to do with it directly, I mean, I assume. Um, but people often point to them, or at least point to the editorial pages of the Dallas Morning News as being partly responsible belief that, that the city was a, a city of wackos. And I, I didn't realize this for a long, long time that um, the Dallas Morning News editorially was very much against John F. Kennedy. Um, and they always gave a lot of space on their pages, as did the Dallas Times Herald. I mean, it wasn't just the Dallas Morning News. Both papers gave a lot of space to folks like Edwin Walker and other right-wingers in this town. And the reality is that there were well, a couple hundred people like that, and they they made the news on a regular basis, but most people just ignored them. That's the story that, that doesn't get out, that um, people outside of Dallas who came here to cover the assassination, they didn't understand that. They didn't realize that the locals paid no attention to Edwin Walker or folks like that. Um, and that's a shame. And you know, the, that, that story needs to come out. And uh, some of the articles that have appeared in recent years have mentioned that, finally. So. I have no idea about that. I mean, uh, I'd heard that story and I hadn't seen it though. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, the Kennedy assassination is uh, 
it, it, it's a runaway urban legend these days. It's, it's, it's very difficult for most people to figure out what's, what's true and what isn't. And uh, the prominent names are going to remain prominent. Um, there were a lot of officers who died in the line of duty, probably doing more courageous things than Tippett was. But they'll never get remembered because they weren't shot by Oswald. <laughs> so, I don't know. Do you have uh, any thoughts on Kennedy in comparison with other presidents you've known in your lifetime? Wow, that's a great question. No, I... Uh, again, I, I, I go back to what I said earlier, and that is um, as interesting as Kennedy was as a person, um, he just didn't get much done. He wasn't able to get people to do things. So in that sense, he was a failure as a president. He was not able to get much legislation passed. Um, Oliver Stone won't tell you this, but the reality is that the public opinion polls in 1963 for President Kennedy were extremely low. He was down in the low 30 percent, and, and maybe in the upper 20s. So you, you know. George Bush uh, today, as controversial as he and some of his policies may be, uh, has more than twice that. He's up in the 60 percent range. So it, I, I remember in the fall of 1963, maybe it was one of the you know, social studies classes or something like that in high school, but uh, it really looked like Kennedy would have, a, would have great difficulty getting reelected. Uh, the economy wasn't doing much. Um, we've been through th uh, two major potential catastrophes with the, uh, the, the Bay of Pigs invasion and the Cuban Missile Crisis and both of these events could have launched us into World War III, you know, so we've been through these things and it, it was kind of scary and it made you wonder whether, whether this Kennedy guy is right for the job or not. So it's, it's interesting how he is perceived in a way today that is completely different than the way he was seen back in 1963. Completely different. Um, people today, when they think back, they say, yeah, the days of Camelot, they were wonderful. Well, there was no Camelot then. That was, that was made up by Jackie after he died. In an in a, uh, interview with uh, Theodore White with Life Magazine, she mentioned that that was his, uh, the, the, the musical Camelot was his, was his favorite and he used to listen to the record album all the time. And Theodore White keyed in on that and decided, well, this was the age of Camelot then. So it was completely post-Kennedy, and it had nothing to do with the Kennedy presidency. But you ask people today, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, those are the Camelot years. They were great. No, they weren't. <laughs> so uh, do you have any speculation on what the world might have been like if he hadn't died here? None at all. Absolutely none. Um, I remember the, the, the 1964 election. Uh, Johnson won, of course, in a landslide. But, you know, if Kennedy hadn't been killed, then he and Johnson would have been running against Barry Goldwater. And that's a scary thing, too. And you know, I, I lived for several years in, in Arizona and uh, knew of Barry Goldwater fairly well following the assassination, and that was, uh, that was pretty scary, too. I, I really don't know. This, um, I think Kennedy's presidency was too short to get a real accurate gauge of what he could have done. If he'd been reelected, and I think that's a big if, but if he'd been reelected, I think the odds are pretty good that he would have uh, been able to to get some of his plans implemented. Um, but I don't know. Fascinating question, and uh, it can never be answered. Uh, the uh, old red courthouse is being renovated. Mm -hmm. No, I really haven't been. Um, I, I've not been involved with any part of that. I mean, it, you know, it's great that they're doing that. Um, I couldn't add anything to that. What about uh, just kind of a couple of things here as far as the effort to try to rename that street for Kennedy? Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't. Don't. No. <laughs> you know, this. Uh, this is a National Historic Site. It was uh, 
Main Street and Commerce Street and Elm Street and how to stay that way. Um, you know, you, you don't have to have a street named after you to show respect for President Kennedy. We have a Kennedy Memorial. Um, hopefully the Sixth Floor Museum can grow and become more of a, a museum that would uh, that has the room and the ability to take a closer look at President Kennedy. Um, but I, I think Dallas has done fine um, and in, in recent years. Yeah, the, the community certainly supports the museum and that needs to continue. Um, but I don't I don't see naming, renaming streets at this point. Um, it sounds silly to me. It sounds silly. <laughs> Speaking of the museum expansion, maybe you can talk a little bit about moving up to the seventh floor. Where did that idea come from? How was it? <laughs> well, you know, again, going back to the earliest days of the museum, it was just supposed to be an exhibit. I remember there were discussions about, you know, if we could only do such and such, if we could only have a, an exhibit space to show things, but it was always, oh, you're dreaming, you know. And I don't think anyone really understood how uh, big and how important this museum could become. It was just going to be an exhibit. And there were, there were people connected with the, uh, the board of directors and some of the city and county officials in those days who were absolutely convinced that after two or three years, everybody's curiosity would be satisfied and they could close down the exhibit. <laughs> they really thought that. And uh, I guess, I don't know, what, what do we have, like five million visitors so far? And, um, I guess, one of the disappointing things is um, our name doesn't tell people who we are. I remember those discussions, some of them anyway, that um, they didn't want to call it the, the Assassination Museum or the Kennedy Assassination Museum. They, they didn't want to use the word assassination at all. And they didn't want to make it the Kennedy Museum because it's not a museum about him. It's about what happened to him in the context of the 60s and who are these Kennedy family people and uh, what, was the, what was the world like in those days. So they were really stuck with a name. and. Uh, <laughs> I think Jeff told us a story, and it reminded me, because I'd heard that too, that in the old days, initially, people thought, the sixth floor, hmm, now that's a restaurant, right? That's what they thought it was, but I remember there were discussions, well, what do we call this thing? You know, and they, they finally just settled on the sixth floor, because that's where the evidence was, and that's where it is, so. But, you know, you say sixth floor museum to people, and they go, huh? Um, I just moved into Arlington, and been meeting the neighbors, and I say, well, I'm, I'm the curator at the Sixth Floor Museum. Well, what's that? I say, at the Kennedy assassination site. Oh, yeah, Th that they know, then they know. But, so, but I don't see any way around that. I, I mean, if you're not going to say, uh, I, I guess you could say the Kennedy Assassination Museum, but if we had done that in the 80s, uh, I don't think there'd be a museum today. Uh, the sensitivities were such, it, it's so hard to explain, and you know, people watching this tape will say, well, I don't understand, why did they not want a museum? Well, they didn't want a museum because they hate the subject, they hate the very thought of it. Um, it caused a lot of pain and anguish to people in Dallas for reasons completely beyond their control. Whether there's a plot or not is not the important part. It ruined the city, in addition to you know, taking the president's life, it just ruined the city. The, the, the city had progress and was and had big momentum and was, and was doing things. And this just brought everything to a halt, virtually. And it took years to get out from under that. I mean, um, when you run into people who were here at the time and they're on vacation somewhere in some other city or some other country and you say, you're from Dallas, Texas, they say, oh, well, that's where they kill presidents. <laughs> you know, they thought it was funny. Dallasites don't, they didn't think it was funny because it isn't. But time takes care of that, they say, so we shall see. As great as that answer was, I'm still wondering about the seventh floor. Ah, <laughs> I've heard of that. Um, the seventh floor is going to be a real challenge for us, of course, because uh, we need to do things in the context of what we do on the sixth floor. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of uh, exhibits and programs we can do up there, um, I think what will probably happen is that we'll realize that we need to cast our net wider rather than uh, narrower. 
Um, and I think that once we have the, uh, the courage to step out of uh, the Kennedy shadow, uh, then I think it'll be fine. Um, but we need to be very careful with the kind of exhibits um, and approaches that we take because there's still a lot of people around who are very sensitive about this subject. And uh, it's not that we're against um, get, getting folks uh, stirred up a little bit. Um, and I use that in the context of the question we get asked a lot is, well, where's the gun? Well, it's at the National Archives in Washington. Well, how come you don't have it here? Well, we haven't asked for it. And the National Archives is protecting it. And even if we did ask, they probably wouldn't loan it to us. But you know they might. And there might be a day when we, when we bring the gun back. Whew, there are going to be some people in Dallas who are just going to really hate that. But the gun is why we're here. The gun didn't do anything on its own. Uh, someone held that gun and squeezed, squeezed the trigger. And whether it was Oswald or someone else or a whole team of people, I don't know. But the gun did it. Uh, it needs to be here someday. So we'll have to see. Um, I remember the, the early discussions that, uh, about the Zapruder film of the assassination. And you know, historians don't edit history. I mean, you take out the stuff that, um, that's hard to follow or that might be confusing to people, but you, know, you leave the things in that, that explain what happened. And the Zapruder film really shows you in many ways, what happened. But it's so graphic. And the discussions were simply that, well, do we show it or do we not? And one of the objections, of course, is that the film in itself is misleading. Um, if, if you zoom in on President Kennedy and slow it down, you see that his head goes forward and down a little bit first, and then there's this violent backward motion. Well, you miss that completely when you're looking at the film normal speed, the normal way. So in a sense, by showing it that way, you're showing history out of context. You can't, you're not really seeing what's going on. But ultimately, the decision was made, and there was a lot of hand wringing over this, um, but the, the decision was made because they anticipated, or we anticipated, they anticipated a lot of children coming through, that since there was no way to warn adults ahead of time, Hey, your kids, you know, you might want to shield your kids from this. Plus, there's no place to put them. You know, how do you move people 40 feet away? You know, <laughs> yeah, there's no way to tell them in 10 seconds, cover your kids' eyes. You know, there's just no way to do that. So we uh, opted to uh, not show the, the headshot frames. Um, and we got criticized for that, and we knew we would. <laughs> And uh, so we get criticized either way, though. We get criticized if we did show it, and we get criticized because we don't. But that's okay. You don't need to see the man die to know that he did die. Do you think 50 years from now, 100 years from now, beyond, that people are coming to this site for the same purpose? Um, n no, I don't. Um, you know, when the museum first opened, it was designed to address the needs of those who were old enough to remember the assassination firsthand. Uh, that was in 1989. Here in 2003, most people alive today were not alive then. They have no firsthand memory of this stuff. Um, and a lot of them, uh, their only real memory of the Kennedy assassination will be the Oliver Stone film. So as we upgrade and expand the exhibit dealing with the assassination, we're going to have to take into account that whole different way of looking at things. People today don't understand that the story about what happened was very simple, or so it seemed, in 1963, 1964. And it's only been the uh, year's worth of questions and realizations that not all the questions were asked because they didn't know all the questions. We still don't know all the questions. Um, it's just not a simple story anymore. Um, so we just need a way to address those concerns um, and, and hopefully put it in the, in, in the context that people can understand why things were done or not done at the time. That would be our, that would be our charge. And it'll be tough, but uh, I'm sure it can be done. 
part of the focus changes, do you think that this night would still be a draw because of that event? Well, history has shown that uh, certain places in U.S. history um, continue to draw crowds for all sorts of reasons. Um, Ford's Theater is one, you know, the Little Bighorn, these important sites that tend to be mythologized um, will still be around. Uh, Jeff West, our director, said uh, a year ago or so that it was his intent with all the things that we do and and all the plans we're making and, and all the people we deal with at the city and county level, uh, it's Jeff's belief that 500 years from now, all the buildings that are in Dallas you know, right now will, will probably not be there anymore, but this one will, and it should be. That's a very powerful statement, very moving statement. Is there a, a Yes. You want to share it? No. <laughs> sure. Um, I've been a registered Democrat all my life until moving to Dallas, and I was not impressed with uh, most of the Democratic candidates over here, so I changed my party affiliation to Republican. <laughs> so maybe I'll find some uh, Republicans who are more like Democrats, just like Reagan and Kennedy. <laughs> now uh, I'll ask you my final question, which is, is there anything that I've missed or no. Uh, um, you know, we, we, we've covered a lot of bases here. And, uh, like I said earlier, you know, I, I do this job for free. Uh, I just wish there had been a museum in, in the 60s because so much has been lost. I mean, even at, uh, uh, astounding as it may seem, the second best film of the assassination is lost. Copies exist. But you know, copies are never as good as the original, and things like that happen. Um, the famous Mary Mormon photograph of the Kennedy assassination is almost completely white now; it's faded. And there's nothing you can do to stop the fading. I mean, I, I, I talked to the scientists at Polaroid. Um, some of their pictures faded, and uh, they weren't they aren't real happy about all that. But they soon figured out how to stop that. But uh, that was after the Kennedy assassination. So, yeah. But, you know, um, we're working to save the important material. Um, we're storing a lot of it for people. Um, normally museums don't do things like that, but we went out and actively asked these people to lend us their films and photographs so we could store them properly with the thought that maybe someday they'd be kind enough to donate them to us. And uh, that has happened little by little. So. At least 500 years from now, people will at least be able to see the films and photographs. They'll still be around, or the latest digitized version of them will, will still be around. That makes me feel good. All right. Thank you very much.